So, there lived two sisters in Bethany, two miles from Jerusalem. They had a brother, Lazarus, the friend of the Lord. The names Martha and Mary start with Mar, which means the household owner. So together with their brother, they were owners of the house in which they received Jesus and his disciples. This is how Luke, Apostle Luke, uh, depicts the scene. So here is two languages in English and Estonian. Now as they went on their way, they entered a village and a woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she went to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful. Mary has chosen the good portion which shall not be taken away from her. So this is um, Luke 10, 38 to 42, and we can well imagine the scene. And uh, one of uh, Spanish um, painters, well-known painters, Diego Velasquez, depicted the scene of Martha being in the kitchen, pre preparing the food, being bitter and grumpy. She faces the viewer, and we can read her emotions. She probably has cried, her eyes are red. Well, in the mirror, oh, or through the window, we see Mary at the feet of Jesus. So we can sense some discord among the two sisters. Just go back one slide so that you imagine where Bethany was located, and you can see that this is the area of um, Israel. It is called West Bank. Um, so it's actually um, Palestinian territory controlled by Israel, unlike Gaza Strip. So we can locate what was happening 2,000 years ago and kind of related to events today. But uh, this is not necessarily relevant to our story. Let me just go back. So two sisters as two types of spiritual life. Um, the first Christian theologians who used these two sisters as representatives of action and contemplation was probably Origen. Born in Egypt, one of the most brilliant early Christian writers who put Greek philosophy, especially Plato, to the service of Christian doctrine. And here is the quotation from his writing. You might reasonably take Martha to stand for action, praxis, and Mary for contemplation, theoria. The mystery of love is lost to the active life unless one directs one teaching and one's exhortation to action toward contemplation. For there is no action without contemplation or contemplation without action. Theoria, an insight gained not through rational means but by revelation, was very important in Origen's teaching. It was uh, also synonymous with Gnosis and um, denoted the insight gained not through rational means. And we know Origen's uh, classification of um, contemplation as coming in three stages, uh, purification, uh, contemplation, and unification. But here he also uh, uses two um, categories, somaticon, somaticoteron, physical, and pneumaticos, spiritual hearing. So Martha represents the physical hearing and Mary, spiritual hearing. Um, the other theologian who used Mary and Martha as two types of um, spiritual and contemplative life was uh, Pope Gregory, Gregory the Great, the one who we uh, know as uh, uh, the one who introduced Gregorian calendar and also 
Gregorian chant. So he um, um, describes Mary as, um, you can see here, um, as the representative of active life, um, oh, sorry, Mary as a representative of contemplative life, which cannot be taken from her because it is eternal. And that's how he interprets this uh, saying that she has chosen good portion, it will not be taken from her because this is eternal, while active life is temporal, so it is inferior to this contemplative life. Um, and this is an interesting um, story about um, so-called um, uh, praying people. Um, so these were the Messalians in the fourth century who were uh, regarded as, uh, um, as kind of a, a sect, and they were uh, itinerant um, preachers, itinerant uh, um, ascetics. And um, from, I mean, the story is quite confusing because uh, we only learn about what Missalians were saying from, uh, from their critics, and uh, apparently they believed that. Um, the root of the evil uh, is inside um, a person, and it's not um, washed away by baptism, but it persists, and the only way to get rid of this inner demon, they call it a demon, is by constant or incessant praying. So, and one of the um, loved, uh, very much loved in the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, authors, uh, Saint Macarius, uh, of Egypt, uh, um, some of his writings been uh, regarded as misalient, but uh, this is again, you know, a very, very confusing story. But there were true, uh, let's say, uh, misalients who believed that uh, one should pray constantly and the kind of physical life and active life is not um, is important, and uh, the story from uh, the Desert Fathers, uh, especially from uh, uh, Abba Silvanus of Gaza in the fourth century, um, is um, saying about one itinerant monk who came to the monastery and uh, asked for um, um, for a cell, for hospitality, and. Uh, uh, Abba Silvanus gave him a cell and gave him um, a book. Um, so this, this itinerant uh, preacher was um, uh, teaching that uh, physical labor is not important and one really shouldn't uh, work, one, one should just pray. So the story goes, uh, when this visitor was not called for the meal, he was a bit surprised. So he came to Abba Silvanus to ask, uh, What's going on? Have you eaten? And Abba Silvanus answered, yes, we have. He said, well, why wasn't I called for the meal? And the old man replied, because you are a spiritual man, so you don't need this kind of food. You have chosen the good portion. So he quotes the gospel here. And read the whole day long, so you don't need carnal food. And this saying from the Desert Fathers concludes, Mary needs Martha. It is really thanks to Martha that Mary is praised. But um, here is, I have quotation uh, from my dear friend Marcus Plastet, because he wrote the whole book about Macarius trying to dispel some myths about Macarius being uh, Missalian. And here he actually juxtaposed Macarius to Evagrius, about whom we will hear tomorrow, saying that Macarius was putting much emphasis on uh, the heart as the center of, of spiritual life, of contemplation, rather than on um, um, intellect or on news, mind. But I hope uh, tomorrow Tarma will speak more about it. So let's move on. Uh, so this is an interesting uh, story, and I call it a little bit uh, like a, a journey into the uh, Byzantine liturgical uh, creative um, work. Uh, so how did Mary, mother of Jesus, Mary of our Lord uh, Christ, become Martha's sister. So I hope you um, all remember uh, the gospel which we read in the beginning. And uh, so 
This is the gospel uh, that is read uh, in the Orthodox Church during the feasts of um, feasts dedicated to Theotokos or Mary, the mother of, of God. So the same Luke 28 to um, <clears throat> Uh, 20, uh, now 20, 38 to 42, 38 to 42. So why I am mentioning this? Because when Livica, our dear Livica, the school director, asked me to organize this conference, which was rather unexpected because we planned to have a gap year and put all our energy into the next uh, Jubilee conference. So. This was the end of August, and that was the feast of Dormition. Dormition is the feast in the Orthodox Church when Theotokos, mother of God, Mary, passed away. So this is the very, very loved feast. And this is the feast when this gospel is read. So Livica comes to me and says, like, we should organize conference about Martha and Mary, and it will be dedicated to contemplation. Where is Livica? <laughs> yeah, so, and uh, this is how the idea came. So it wasn't my idea, it was um, uh, her idea. Who remembers what is read in the Orthodox Church during that day? Okay, this is, oops, no. Okay, this is Luke. Um, nobody remembers. Okay, this is Luke 38 to 42, 10, 38 to 42, which ends up with this. As Jesus was saying these things about Mary's good portion, a woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Okay, this is... So what's happening here? So we have a house of Ma Mary and Martha. Martha is very much concerned about all this food and then suddenly we have a crowd. So no wonder Martha was so worried, like how to feed you know, all these people. Where does the crowd come from? Okay, who can answer me? Microphone is here. Ah, <laughs> so we can see. So what is in between? So the ending comes from the next chapter, Luke 11, 27 to 28. So there are two, what is called in, uh, in Slavonic, zachal, and in Greek, perikope. So there are two, um, extracts from the gospel put together. Just imagine, like people who don't read the gospel, like, okay, in the past many people couldn't read. They only heard the gospel in church. When they hear it, they think about this woman who is sitting at the feet of Jesus. So maybe she is the mother of Jesus. Maybe she is Mary. So this is how Martha becomes a um, sister. And this is the gospel, this is the combination uh, which is read in um, all feasts of Theotokos apart from Annunciation. So it's the uh, nativity of Theotokos, entry to the temple, their mission, and the favorite Russian feast of the protective veil of Theotokos, uh, Pakrov. So this is what I call the Byzantine liturgical montage. So Luke 10, 38 to 42 is combined with Luke 11, 27 to 28. Um, the art of montage means that you put two pieces together that create additional meaning. So what kind of meaning is created here? In order to uh, cut my story short, I would quote here um, a Russian um, um, ascetic and um, writer, ascetic writer called Ignati Brinchininov. He was quite an unusual uh, 
um, man. He was made a bishop, but he was probably the only bishop in, in, in the Russian Orthodox Church who never went to a theological seminary and who was a nobleman, an officer, uh, who gave up his brilliant career in, in the army in order to set at the feet of an optional elder Leonid. So he gave up everything he had uh, and became a novice in, in the Optina Pustin. So he was the one who kind of popularized the ascetic uh, uh, writings, the Dobratalubia, Philokalia, writings to the Russian audience. So he says here, Martha, um, who cared for the hospitality of Jesus Christ is an image of physical asceticism, while Mary, who listened to the words of Christ, is an image of spiritual asceticism. Christ didn't reject Martha's service, but he praised Mary more. And here he comes to exactly this passage that is read during the feasts of Theotokos. The most holy mother of God served Christ both physically as she bore him in her womb, gave birth to him and cared for him as a mother, and spiritually because she kept all these things in her heart. So she is blessed as, is blessed as the mother of the Lord and the one who heard his word and kept it. So basically what he is saying here is that Mary is the combination of Mary, the mother of Jesus, is a combination of Martha and Mary as two types of uh, Christian life. And I think this is really um, the only conclusion one could make after listening to the way uh, this uh, gospel is read in the church. And that's probably what the Byzantine liturgists were trying to convey. But now, uh, let me move to the Gospel once more again, please bear with me. So, um, I ask if Martha is as important as Mary, if she, if Mary cannot exist without Martha, so what is Martha's problem? Maybe she doesn't have a problem, but why Velasquez, you know, depicted her with red eyes? So, what is going on there? And here we go to a little bit into the Greek um, terminology. So here is Luke 10, 38 to 42 again. So we see there are different terms that Luke is using to explain what's happening with Martha. In 39, uh, so he um, explains what is Mary is doing. So it's, uh, she is listening to the teaching of Jesus not, not just teaching, but logon, so logon, logos. Now, number 40, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And so here is the word perispato, which is, uh, means to be distracted, to be overoccupied, busy, driven about mentally. <laughs> so not just distracted, but you know, quite, quite distracted. And in 41, he says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. And here, two more terms are used. Merim bow, sorry about, for my Greek, to be anxious, to be troubled with cares. And thorobashi, uh, thorobeo, thorobo, to make a noise or a pro, be turbulent, to disturb, throw into confusion, and even to set the city on an uproar. So this is the very strong word. So it's um, not just troubled, but very troubled. So what we have here is Jesus uh, addresses to Martha using, like repeating her name. What does it mean, Martha, Martha? In uh, the New Testament, repetition of the name means um, affection. He loves Martha. He is concerned about her. So this is, this is not just uh, like being dismissive about uh, her service, her diakonia, but it is concern about her state. So what we see here is that the service of Martha is valuable, but her preoccupation with things drives her to an emotional state which is not right. So we 
see here is that Martha is preoccupied with things or dishes, many dishes, forgetting about the main reason why she's doing it, the presence of the Lord in her house. And the sitting at the feet of Jesus, which again, like only disciples could do, so Mary being a disciple, listening to the word of God, to Logos, uh, is also connected with another pericope where Mary is bringing the holy oil, not holy oil, sorry, the precious oil to anoint the feet of, of Jesus. So we have these two parallels with Mary's apparently um, not very um, uh, rational behavior. So she's using this precious oil, you know, which Judas proposes to sell for 300 denarii and give it to the poor. So let's say, you know, it seems like an act uh, that is not uh, irrational, not rational. So what we have here is that um, the story of Mary and Martha cannot be just simply told as the story of two types of spiritual life. You know, the one is contemplative, another active. But we have also a story of um, someone who um, needs to come back to the real um, meaning of why one is doing that. So, and this is, uh, this is about um, uh, listening to the word and uh, keeping it. So I'm just going to jump, how much time I have? Jump to some examples, three minutes, right. About uh, the use of Martha and Mary as models of spiritual life and you, See here uh, one of the, uh, maybe one of the first communities in Russia which was called by the names of Martha and Mary. Um, uh, in 1905, a terrorist bomb exploded in the carriage that drove the Moscow mayor, Grand Duke Sergei. His wife, uh, granddaughter of Queen Victoria, Grand Duke Duchess Elizabeth, collected the pieces of her husband's body across the square. And in three days, she visited this uh, terrorist in, in, in prison. And later, she founded a community that was dedicated to Martha and Mary. And it wasn't a monastery. It was a community of women who lived together and they, um, they were dedicated to the service. So they had a hospital, they looked after the poor, there was an orphanage, a school. In 1918, um, Grand Duchess Elizabeth was uh, shot by the Bolsheviks. Her body was thrown in the mine in Alapaevsk. Later, her remains were interred in the church of Mary Magdalene in Jerusalem. Another example of uh, somebody who can be called an unexpected contemplative was Mother Maria of Paris, Mother Maria Skopcova, a Russian emigre who died in a concentration camp uh, um, after being put there by the Nazis because she was helping the Jews during the occupation of, of France. She looked after the destitute emigres. She was roaming the markets in Paris, buying uh, cheap um, uh, food in order to feed all these um, poor um, migrants. And she was constantly busy and not many people approved this kind of uh, style of life. But why do we call her contemplative? Look at this um, embroidery. So this is the Last Supper and you saw one before. So this one is also embroidery by Mother Maria. And think about the art of embroidery. So those of you, I can see somebody who is knitting. So. <laughs> And this, this kind of uh, occupation uh, is very contemplative. So by kind of putting stitches together, you know, you're not just putting stitches together, you're also saying a prayer. So that's why Mother Maria can be regarded as a contemplative. And the last example, or one of the last examples, is um, coming from Bethany. You know, Bethany um, that was... Uh, 
the place where Martha and Mary uh, greeted uh, Jesus. So today there is an uh, Orthodox school for girls, uh, Orthodox as well as Muslim girls, and it's been founded by two Anglican sisters who on the way from India where they lived in the mission, came to the Holy Land and discovered um, Bethany and became Orthodox and took names Martha and Mary. And today one of the sisters who is um, directing the school is Sister Martha Wall from Germany, so she's German. So these are just examples of how this um, Martha and Mary um, models can inspire um, people today. One more example is the community of St. John the Baptist in Essex, where thousands of people come um, you know, to visit, and there is uh, hospitality by monks and nuns, um, and lots of ministry, and at the same time, very, very intensive prayer life. So let me conclude. Um, in the Orthodox iconography, Martha and Mary are always depicted together. They represent two sides of us because we are all called to service and contemplation. We are both Martha and Mary. Sometimes, most of the time, we are distracted by our worldly duties. There are families to support, children to raise, students to teach, dishes to be washed, and the house to look beautiful. But all these activities have some purpose. They should have logos. Martha was getting ready for the visit of the Lord. She was doing her best not to show off her skills as a hostess, but to serve him when he walked on this earth. So, big question is how one can keep one's service, dear Kania, and listen to the God's word to Modern technology can distract us, but also can be helpful. I listen to audiobooks while driving, cooking, or doing house chores. Church music can also create a soundscape useful for meditation while doing mechanical works. The desert monks were making baskets. Why basket making was so popular? Because they took a passage of the scripture while doing mechanical weaving, and the word from the scripture was rotating while they were making a basket. To sum up, Jesus loved Martha, and she was not a bad student, but loved him even more fervently as Saint Ephraim believed. Martha's service is not inferior to contemplative life. It should not be separated from contemplative life. But wh why Martha was reproached was for putting too much effort and mind into things, while only one thing was important, or is important the word of God, divine logos, and memory of God. So to conclude, I just want to call every one of us, you know, to, especially those of us who are stressed and burned out, to look deeper into the cause of our stress, find time for prayer and contemplation, a time to be alone, and to call all of us, you know, not to forget how dear we are to God and stop be wishing to be merry because we are already merry. Thank you. And one more, just last slide. These are the words which I want to finish with in Arabic and Hebrew and Slavic. Thank you.